John McArdle Jr. is currently the 16th Vice Chancellor of the University of the South, and he's the President Emeritus of Middlebury College. He is a distinguished historian and a respected national leader in liberal arts education. I would go so far as to say he's one of the most preeminent scholars in Civil War history in the country. He holds his undergraduate degrees from Washington and Lee University and his PhD from Harvard. He possesses a record of achievement as a scholar of the American South and is author of The Idea of a Southern Nation, which won the Alan Nevins Prize, which is the most distinguished history prize. His specialty, as I said, is 19th century. And if these scholarly chops are not enough, John McArdle was a guest on The Colbert Report. <laughs> when I was a strapping 130-pound freshman at Middlebury College, Dr. McArdle was a newly minted professor from Harvard University, and he quickly established himself as a rock star professor long before YouTube was even a thing. His classes were vibrant, relevant, and meticulously prepared, and certainly much more intellectual than I was capable of understanding at the time. I took more than one class from him, as did my close circle of friends, and we comprised his Myrmidons. We admiringly nicknamed him after the reigning tennis champ of the day, John McEnroe, and simply referred to him as Johnny Mac. By the time of our 25th reunion, however, Professor McArdle was now president of the college. I believe we adopted a more deferential form of address to him at that point. It is truly an honor to welcome here today Vice Chancellor John McArdle from the University of South, my old friend and my old mentor. Thank you for that spectacular introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure uh, to be with you today. Uh, and this is a day, as you know, for students in particular, but also for faculty and staff and parents. Uh, a time of ends and beginnings and a moment to recognize and accept and perhaps even to celebrate both the continuities and the ambiguities of lives, which always, if kept in proper balance, are poised like the classical figure of Janus, for whom the month of January is named. One eye fixed on the past, certain, known, remembered, and the other eye trained on the future, uncertain, unknown anticipate. Graduates today stand athwart the course of what Isaac Watts's beloved hymn refers to as time's ever rolling stream, which will eventually bear all our souls away. And it's a particular pleasure to reconnect with your head of school. I've known Bobby, excuse me, Bob Hill for a very long time. His family and mine were close friends over many years uh, in Middlebury. I knew him as a former student, as a fine tennis player, and as a man of sterling character. I don't need to tell you how fortunate you are to have him as your head of school, nor do I need to state how proud his alma mater is of him and of the work he has done and is doing. I'm truly delighted to be here. And as you know, I join you from Suwannee, more formally known as the University of the South. Uh, at Suwannee, we know what it means to live in a fallen world. What do I mean by that? Well, our university was founded in the 1850s, during a time of great prosperity. Our founders, three Episcopal bishops, envisioned what would be the first genuinely comprehensive university half a generation ahead of Johns Hopkins and Chicago and Stanford, for which they had received 5,000 acres of land and half a million dollars, every cent in the bank, an endowment half the size of Harvard's. But what these founders possessed in vision, they utterly lacked in timing. For within a month, 
after the dedication of the cornerstone in October of 1860, the academic, first for the first academic building on campus, Lincoln was elected, the southern states seceded, war followed, and all, everything was lost. In 1866, they returned, determined to start over, chastened by experience, still committed to a vision. And so we know the truth of the saying variously attributed that if you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans. In fact, all of us in the field of higher education inhabit this same fallen world, a world in which the best we can hope for is an ever lesser degree of imperfection and a divine grace that loves us in spite of our folly and forgives us all our sins. On this last point, some examples are in order. I recall, for example, a final exam in which an imaginative history student identified the publisher of the progressive, muckraking McClure's magazine one S.S. McClure, as the name of the battleship blown up in Havana Harbor, thereby beginning the Spanish-American War. Or a paper inveighing passionately against the Federalists in the 1790s for their support of the notorious Alien and Sedation Act. Or the student reaching a high moral pitch in an essay on the 19th century social philosopher, Henry George, who proposed, according to this particular account, a tax on the unearned excrement in property value. <laughs> but my favorite involves a student on a study abroad program in France. The night before, the faculty leader of the group made clear the schedule for the next day. The bus will be pulling away at 8.15, at 8.15 sharp. Got it? Understand? Not 8.16, not 8.17, but 8.15. Be on time. Next morning, at precisely 8.15, the bus doors close and the vehicle pulls away. Two minutes later, an out-of-breath student comes running up in a state of panic, and not knowing where to turn, musters her best French vocabulary and shouts aloud to anyone who would listen, je suis gauche derrière. <laughs> I am left behind. Idiom matters. Je suis gauche derrière. Imaginative, but wrong. <laughs> Book of Proverbs asserts, happy are those who find wisdom, and concludes, those who hold her fast are called happy. So let's think for a few moments about wisdom. And we might begin our meditation on this topic on such a day as this by pausing to give thanks to those who have been for the class of 2017 sources of wisdom, to your families who nurtured you, who lovingly, trustingly committed you to this school, who saw in you their own hope for immortality, who gave you life and opportunity, and who now surely on this day wish for you the wisdom that springs from knowledge. To your teachers who gave you knowledge and who modeled wisdom, teachers in the classroom, of course, but who were also called coaches, librarians, custodians, dining hall workers, groundskeepers, educators all. And perhaps most enduringly to friends, friends with whom you shared all manner of experiences and from whom you received a substantial part of your education. Friends with whom you learned to do good well. There's a prayer in the Jewish liturgy for memory. A portion of it goes like this. Memory can tell us only what we were, 
in company with those we loved. It cannot help us find what each of us alone must now become. Yet no one is really alone, it continues. Those who live no more still echo within our thoughts and words. And what they did is part of what we have become. And so today, we are surrounded by, and indeed perhaps at least from time to time, overwhelmed by the presence of memory. Memory matters, of course. Memory is necessarily selective. Memory can be a source of comfort in times of trouble. Memory can be a guide in times of uncertainty. And we also know we choose what to remember and in choosing also choose what to forget. For individuals, for communities, for entire cultures. Memory is a part of what sustains and shapes and defines and directs. But memory, if you're not careful, can become nostalgia and can then make you, turn you into an, an alum who becomes an insufferable crank. <laughs> and so memory is only half of what you take with you today. The other half, nostalgia's antidote, if you will, is hope. Hope and memory. Memory and hope. And to put it another way, this weekend is a way station on a never-ending journey to wisdom. A journey that is also, as Proverbs reminds us, the way to pleasantness and peace. And so what might I presume to offer you that will not quickly, probably, if we're lucky, by sunset, even s? Well, only this, that you take with you today something more than memory and something on which you can base your hope. Something like, first, humility. I still remember William Cooper's words inscribed over the stage in my own high school auditorium. Knowledge is proud that he has learned so much. Wisdom is humble that he knows no more. We could all use a bit more humility, a bit more willingness, as Benjamin Franklin once put it, to doubt a little each of us in our own infallibility and a bit more acknowledgement that in this fallen world we inhabit, truth can never be fully revealed, never wholly discerned, but in fragmentary moments at least, it may be sensed, hinted at, approached, approximated, and a corollary. Freedom of speech is meaningless without also the freedom a precious freedom to listen. Or perhaps self-restraint. Sawani so students know that one of my favorite quotations comes from a speech made late in his life by the distinguished statesman and orator Daniel Webster. Liberty can exist, he stated, only in proportion to wholesome restraint. Or, as Virginia Woolf has put it, to enjoy freedom, we have to control ourselves. It is so very easy to say or to tweet the first thing that comes into our minds. <laughs> or to surrender ourselves to the illusion of our own immortality by failing to consider the consequences of the choices we make before we make them or to blame someone else when things go wrong, or to succumb to the seduction offered by whatever institution or candidate for public office offers the most free stuff. Society is in great danger of losing that balance between freedom and restraint. Liberty, 
without restraint is chaos, anarchy. Restraint without liberty is tyranny. Self-restraint, the restraint that comes not from above, not from without, but from within. Self-restraint makes freedom possible and is the best antidote to the coarseness and vulgarity that continue to erode our common life. Keep your distance and your soul from the madding crowd and current fashion. Choose your own course and choose it wisely. Because third and finally, with humility and with self-restraint will come selflessness. A consideration of views other than your own, a recognition that true happiness can never be pursued or realized as an end in itself, but is rather a byproduct of experience, even struggles and setbacks, and by the surrender of self to something greater and nobler. Someday, says Aeneas, at a moment of utter despair in the Aeneid, even this will be remembered with pleasure. With these things, with humility, with self-restraint, and with selflessness, will come in time wisdom, a recognition of life's uncertainty, and a willingness and ability to deal with reality whenever and however it presents itself. Ah, but life is like that, cries Agatha Christie's famous detective, Hercule Poirot, at a moment of discovery. Life is like that. It does not permit you to arrange and order it as you will. And so let what you have learned from family, teachers, friends, prepare you for uncertainty. And let the character that has been shaped in this place be the rudder of your life. As the great historian Henry Adams wrote toward the end of his monumental autobiography, every man and woman with self-respect enough to become effective has had to account to himself, for himself, somehow. <clears throat> to himself, for himself, somehow. This accounting to yourself, for yourself, somehow, requires more than mere knowledge. Your brightness, your resume may carry you far, but they will not enable you to give that final accounting. That will require you to summon all that you have learned at this school. Call the tally of those virtues character, perhaps, or duty, or moral compass. Call it, if you will, faith. But above all, call it selfless. And call it timeless. Glimpse it, always in the distance, ever on the horizon, but follow its gleam. Make it yours. Make it you. And so my hope for you this commencement day is a hope I confidently believe is shared by all those gathered here this morning. And it is that you will take with you and continue to nurture within you the completing of your incompleteness, a pride tempered with humility so that you may find wisdom, hold her fast, no true happiness. Continue to discern the better, better angels of your own nature. And remember that you caught your first glimpses of those angels here. So that all your works, in the words of St. Paul, will show thought for what is noble in the sight of all. Do good well. Congratulations and Godspeed, class of people.